Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Jay Shah, Vice President and Head Cultural Outreach Mahindra Group, Sanjay Roy, Managing Director, Team Work Arts, Ankur, Judith, Purnika, and my other colleagues at Meta Secretariat, I would like to welcome you all, or actually welcome you back to the first virtual Meta. Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards 2020 is celebrating its 15th landmark edition with a first of its kind <coughs> virtual award ceremony on August 30th. The ceremony will feature an online event with leading theatre personalities, including past and present nominees and Meta awardees. The lead up to the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards 2020 will include a three week long celebration starting today with a theatre critics conference, followed by the launch of first ever published edition of the Meta Best Original Script on August 18th and a tribute for the Meta 2020 Lifetime Achievement Awardee Barry John on uh, August 23rd and culminating in a pioneering virtual award ceremony on August. In today's conference, we had a wonderful session this morning on the impact and state of theater in India during COVID-19 with Neelam Man Singh, Rashmi Dhanwani, MK Raina, and Kwasa Thakur Padamsi, moderated by Sanjoy K. Roy. Our next session for today is censorship and self-censorship. -censor and our panelists for today, Dr. Arvind Ganachari, Anjum Katyal, Lara Jasani, and Sudhanva Deshpande. It will be moderated by Deepa Punjani. The curator and moderator of the panel, Deepa Punjani, has been closely engaged with theater and theater criticism for several years. She represents the Indian National Section of the International Association of Theater Critics called IATC. Uh, Deepa's MPhil thesis studied the work of select Indian women theater practitioners in the broad context of feminism and gender representation on the Indian stage. Deepa is a lawyer by profession and also writes about legal issues. In a latter role, she is keenly interested in dialogues between the judiciary and civil society and in the intersection between law, politics and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, censorship and self-censorship. Deepa, over to you. Thank you, Suraj. Thank you, Sanjoy Roy, Judith, Purnika, Rajat and everyone else in the Meta team for this webinar. The Mind of Excellence in Theatre Awards, like many other festivals, has had to move online this year. I wish all the selected production teams for this edition my best, not just for the awards, but also for you to stay resilient. I welcome our panelists for the session and all of you who have taken the time out for this. Well, there is relentless online activity. So if you have decided to spend time with us, let me just say you made a good choice. And why do I confidently say this? Well, that's because we have a wonderful panel. It is also an important panel, and significantly, uh, it is a panel comprising distinct voices. Now, if I were to go into the biographies of each of these distinguished speakers today, I take up a lot of time allotted for the webinar. So as I speak, someone from the Meta team will be posting a couple of links that will direct you to the brief biographies of the panelists. If you've not already read these, you will also find a brief outline of their presentations as handy reference. I do suggest that you look through those outlines as well. But warm hellos are in order. And so I welcome historian scholar Dr. Arvind Ganachari. Now, I had the good fortune to listen to Dr. Ganachari while he delivered a lecture at Wilson College. And this, this was at the time of the World War I centenary. And Dr. Ganachari's lecture was in context of the Indian soldiers who were recruit, recruited for the war effort then and at the behest of their British masters. It was quite a fascinating lecture. And uh, welcome Sudhanwa Deshpande. He's actor, director, editor, and I would say a proud cyclist. And Sudhanwa's recent book on uh, the momentous staging of Halla Bowl and you know where he's wonderfully recounted you know it's his first hand account of you know the tragic events that happened that day that claimed the life of the iconic Saptar Hashmi it's a must read and I'm saying this not just for theater people or those who are interested in theater but I think it serves as an important social and a political document of post-independent Indian history so please please do pick up the book Anjum Katyal, she's writer, critic, translator, and editor, and used to be, I mean, editor 
of the very, very popular and well-known Siegel books, as well as the Siegel Theatre Quarterly, which I think was a very, very important theatre journal. I have known of Anjum professionally, but this is the first time that we are going to be interacting. So I'm looking forward to that, Anjum. And finally, we have uh, civil and human rights uh, advocate. She's a lawyer. I've seen her advocacy in action on ground uh, more recently during the Citizen Amendment Act protests. She's a passionate spokesperson for the vulnerable and the underprivileged. Welcome, Lara Jasadi. Thank you all for being here, really. Okay, so before we actually go on to the presentations by the panelists today, I'd just like to kind of um, uh, give the framework for what we're about to discuss today. Now, censorship in theater and drama is hardly a new topic. It has been debated and discussed many, many times. Yet what I have found that we have often struggled to have comprehensive and even timely discussions about this topic. And so while I was putting together my thoughts for this webinar, I realized that the subject requires us to have in-depth conversations, regular conversations from multiple perspectives. And if the solutions, if they can be found, if only, I, I believe they also lay in an approach you know, that combines the rigors of a theoretical framework with grassroots advocacy. Having said that, I think it is equally important for us to go back to the basics. If a democracy like ours safeguards free speech and expression, whose free speech and expression needs to be safeguarded? If one person's virtue is another person's vice, and I'm being deliberately gender neutral here, who is to say who should be censored and who should be not? Now, at the risk of even sounding controversial and deliberately so, for example, if there's a play valorizing Gotse, should it be banned? Or can a Muslim or a Dalit be pres prescribed from playing Ra? Now, uncomfortable as these questions may be, I believe they should be asked and discussed. What is the meaning of balancing interests, especially in a plural society like ours, where religious freedom is also protected? Where does creativity end and where does defamation begin? Now, should the arts even be bothered about these questions if creativity must remain unfettered? Now, tricky questions, all of these, but very important ones to address. And since our panel has a legal expert, she may want to take up some of these concerns later. I have been very lucky to have this multidisciplinary panel that will engage with this topic from the unique perspectives, backgrounds, and even first-hand accounts and experiences, or run-ins, you might say, that they have had with the power structures existing at a point in time. Now, we have always known that theater artists have been at the risk of direct and indirect forms of censorship. There are draconian laws, and then there is moral policing. There's self-policing as well. And we are going to be addressing self-censorship in this session. So these are not new phenomena, and they can be studied. And certainly what you may notice that there are periods in which the levels of censorship differ, equally self-censorship so. Because a recent study in America, for example, where free speech is protected by the American Constitution's First Amendment has shown an uptake, in fact, in self-censorship. It is another thing that even the most liberal democracy like the US, you know, that, which considers free speech as a sacrosanct right, has other laws that contribute to a regime of censorship. And coming to our own country, we realize that different periods in our history and some exigencies in particular have defined the censorship of the time. And in theater, the ultimate question always is, therefore, which play is dangerous and which play is not? Ultimately, also, we are concerned about our theater walas, our theater artists. How can we protect their creative right? More crucially, how do we assure their safety when they are outperforming their work? Or how do we assure them to create freely and without fear? How do we tell them not to muzzle their own voices? How do we get them to act in solidarity that is not sporadic, but sustained? How short is the distance really between censorship and terror? 
So, well, I realize that I have posed a lot of questions, but I think as the moderator, I can get away with it. And now I will I'm just going to say that each of the panelists are going to be speaking for about 10 to 12 minutes before we launch into a discussion. At the end, we will have a Q&A. So viewers are encouraged to post their questions. And if you have questions for any one of the panelists, please clarify the panelists. We'll try to take as many relevant questions as we can. Yeah. So over to you, Professor Ganachari. Oscar. It's, it's really my pleasure to be amongst all you people. When one talks about censorship of the drama or theater, which I have been concerned with, with Marathi theater from 1860 to around 1936, I felt three uh, important aspects. There are three important aspects. First and foremost is perceptions of the ruling elite. Now, that ruling elite means the state. Primarily the colonial state I was. But I realized today that what colonial state did continues even in independent India. And therefore, what happened in colonial state is equally relevant to be studied today. And the changing perceptions of the ruling elite depends on, on uh, the changing political situation and to which the people react to it. There are, in when one talks of state, one got to talk about the usage of legal measures, legal measures. And the measures came in particular time. To, there is, there was, the, I, I'll give you an example. The Dramatic Performances Act, which took place in, which was brought out in 1876. Please remember that it was not brought out as an act only against the drama, but it came as a cognate law to the act of law of sedition. So the law of sedition said that whosoever, section 124A, which was put in by an amendment in 1870, it said, whosoever by word spoken or intended to be read by, by signs, by visible representations, and all this, which brings the lawfully constituted government into disrepute, distemper, disloyalty, disapprobation, these were the words which were used. Now, the Dramatic Performances Act came because of certain dramas, which was Chakadarpan in Bengal, Malarauchan Natak, and there are plenty of uh, dramas which were, which were brought, not just Dakshinaranjan Chattopadhyay, as well as Upendranath Das in Bengal and uh, Nava Kanitkar in Maharashtra. I'm not going into those details, but what happens is to those particular laws could not be brought under the, under the Sedition Act because, and that's where the, this particular law, Dramatic Performances Act came only as a supplement to the, uh, the law of sedition. This is extremely important. You know, the words incorporated in it was scandalous and uh, uh, of, of scandalous nature, of defamatory nature, uh, of depraved and corrupt influences, bringing about corrupt influences, this was only to supplement. And one clause of that said, of 1876 Dramatic Performances Act, that no conviction under this act shall be a bar, they say, uh, uh, shall be bar uh, prescription under section 124A. So 124A also parts of form, forms a part of this act. Now why I'm saying this is that the reaction to this, all the, the political situation was such that people were denied of all legitimate interest of grievancing their, putting their grievances, ventilating their grievances. And it is in that background, people came out with, people in Maharashtra, dramatists used this as a medium to mass mobilize as the nationalist sentiment and particularly against the state. But it did not come out uh, let me tell you that from 1870, when the Seditious Act was passed, till 1891, it was not operated. The government did not think that it was right to put it into operation. In 1875, the Dramatic Performances Act came. It was not put. It was not even operated in 1897 against the uh, uh, drama called Bandavi Mochan, because they felt that it was. 
there was also a caveat in this 1870 act and that caveat was that you could not cannot no provisional say provincial government could implement that particular act unless prior sanction was sought from the calcutta government from the imperial government and and there was always a conflict between calcutta government and bombay government they felt that Bo bombay government was raising unnecessarily a un cry against the ramas and therefore they were not forthcoming with the uh, and this made many bombay government to come up with different solutions they did not use this acts at all because this calcutta government would not agree and this is exactly what is happening even today they used they inserted amendments to district police act they had amendment to the city police act they had amendment uh, was carried in 1897 to the uh, to the, the uh, section 124a a new uh, section was introduced in 1897 153 communal disharmony now, now all these uh, things then uh, another was used of section 108 for criminal procedure court against and which was very very uh, intensely used against the actors and the theatrical personalities for bounding them and seeking personal security mind you 200 rupees personal security in 1908 people used to have salary of 6 rupees to give that was the kind uh, the, this law was used and then comes the uh, the act of 1910 the indian press act now all these acts are still in operation and the government used this so this is one way of bringing of the state and the the, the more the state people reacted and british government and uh, the theatrical movement acted and reacted the more oppressive they became the more uh, the, the theatrical personalities the dramatist and everyone got more themes and it provided more themes and they took number of different ways of how to and that brings me to the second aspect of it the uh, uh, origins and intellectual origins and progression of the theatrical movement they if one takes of of uh, uh, neel darpan or chaka darpan and these acts this was what was a protest against the british po the policies it was against particularly a planters class which was which the british aligned themselves with because of being european as a racist major and what is most important is when one says about the theatrical the progression of the theatrical movement few questions become most relevant to us what the nationalist wanted to convey and to whom and what was how were the uh, what methods they their methods depended on the the mean the ideas they wanted to project it to the state to, to the both to the state as well as to the people uh, and 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 that was against the political situation so you find up to 1880 a uh, different majors i mean this was i would rather put it a phase of uh, theater of protest but in 1880 to 1886 you have the phase where people are for the majors like and uh, reformist majors as well as against it so it is more of a critiquing british policies but from 1887 onwards till 97 you have the theater of resistance people are now taking up particularly in the light of tilak case of 1897 and from 1897 onwards and with swadeshi movements and everyone you have different things and now in this what happens is what you see is a change of british attitude of liberal attitude in 1881 there was a play called harun rashid which was staged in bombay and that uh, uh, many people uh, complained to the government that it hurts the mis the feelings of muslims so the uh, the commissioner of police and uh, and and the one uh, say uh, the question raman west he questioned if it if this play does not harm the uh, the sentiments of persian muslims why should it hurt in the indian muslims here in bombay this was in 1891 but in the changed political situation in 1897 plays are brought against they are banned under section 153 
Shivaji Solunuke address to Aurangzeb is now treated as hurting Muslim sentiments. This is this is where the government reacts, makes difference, brings divide and rule also. And this is uh, in 1890, uh, 1905, a play Kichakwad or uh, you say or that kind was seen as a fight between moderates and extremists, which was not banned. But once they come to know that that the dramatist who was a Tilkite, a, 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 a sub editor of Kesari, along with Tilak, who had authored a number of articles for which Tilak went to jail. Now he comes up with Kichakwad. The government thinks that it is against moderates and extremists. But the moment they come to know that that particular dramatist was in Nepal for manufacturing of bombs and the CID it gets, it re it gets revealed to the CID, it, within 24 days, the ban comes not from the Indian government, it comes from London. And where questions were, he said, the articles were written on Kichakwad. Now, but in the change circumstances, a person even uh, uh, say mimics or dresses himself like Tiller or any other personality also becomes a part of the, uh, it comes under government radar. So the government becomes more and more repressionary. And the words like Swadeshi, the words like, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the theatrical uh, stage these people also use number of other methods nandi which is addressed normally to ganpati or natya devta was now addressed to swatantra devta and surprisingly there was a nandi in a in a play uh, and which was addressed to vishnu and in the margin the sec secretary writes this is Stuart, he writes there Please ascertain whether Vishnu is, uh, is an incarnation of Vishnu. So how the changed atmosphere becomes very, very handbills which were distributed at that time. And most importantly, again and again, they realize that this is a visual effect. This is a visual effect. It is. It has more impact. And the word that they use, and I would like to specifically use it to tell you that word is they say that it is it is uh, so it makes impact on unwashed unwashed ignorant poor masses and and they use the unwashed they say and it reaches to the villages because most they became this became a very different thing because one thing was the british did not know how to implement they brought all the law, laws of censorship and everything from england what was discussed in 1843 but this was a vernacular press they did not know the nuances of the language they did not and it, there were touring theaters so they went to village to village they could they, they could earlier say that certain uh, they say theaters should be licensed but these uh, the dramas were not performed in theater they were touring theaters they went village to village and therefore it became all the more problem a very big problem and and the more the you say government repression came the more the nationalists used backdrop scenes where you now the person who not only the backdrop scene was confiscated the person who painted that they put CIDs against him that fellow was brought to book he uh, surety was taken 200 rupees was taken and he was made to say that he would not paint it like this i must tell you that alar nisanaji uh, nisarshi has brought a wonderful book of marathi theater backdrop scenes and that will show how even such minor thing minor things were equally you say the government realized now the result of all this of after 1910 comes is dramatist who like Kharilka take to Sangeet music, this is a drama. I'm not going into the details because it, it will take long time. But this is one aspect. And uh, they, they, they also started Bharat Natya Samaj. They also started Ranga Seva journals in 1900. Bharat Natya Samaj started in 1904. Bharat, say, so these, every, 
uh, exhibitions were arranged where theatrical materials, you know, drop backdrop scenes and everything that was required for theater were where where exhibitions were conducted so that people can use them. Now, the 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 dramatists themselves had their own meetings in Bharatnatya Samaj. They so many things of what could be done against the government was discussed. Now, against the, and, and then I will give one example and move on to the last aspect, which I am and now would like to emphasize that songs were used. So, songs were used, and one of the songs was written by Vir Vamanro Joshi of Akula, who was an, ext an extremist Kilkite. He wrote the song called Parashara Pashadaive Jacha Gala Lagila. Now, this song was written in 1913, was put in a drama called Ranadam Now, the song is so important that in 1940, this song was sung by Lata Mangeshkar's father, Bharat, father, Master Dinanath, before the Viceroy when he came to Bombay. And after hearing half, half an hour, Viceroy asked the, his uh, ADC uh, what was the meaning. And then he explained Parvashita means slavery. And slavery has come up. The news of slavery is tightening to us. The moment Viceroy heard that, they said, blacklist this man. And the um, thing was stopped there itself. Now, I admire these people were possessed of this man. And uh, only this yeah, thing did not come up because uh, it, it lost its it's a glamour and it lost its because of the mass movement, mass agitation that was carried by Gandhi. Not that this theatrical movement became is less important, but it, 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 it became less effective after mass movement. And the last point that I would like to tell you, that all your censorship, they, it's, it's not just important to have the laws, it is important to have, uh, to detect where comes censorship. And therefore, what is important is what are the means of surveillance. So the British government came up with report on the native newspapers. Any review, any handbill in newspaper attracted government attention to that drama. They also came up with CID records, what was called as Bombay Presidency Police Abstracts of Intelligence. It is a wonderful CID records, and I felt that you cannot write history because it, the information of a certain drama being seditious or having some problem with the government was conveyed through the police in the abstracts of intelligence. Now, these were surveillance measures. There were many other, apart from local police. So, and then comes that once this is they reported to the police, the police reported it to the government, the government confiscates. They use first different law and then they go through the entire process and they say that it is first banned under this law, but it cannot be banned under that law. So we are supposed to have taken this particular law into consideration. So they first ban it under something and then they use the law only to fix it in a legal fiction that we do everything by law. And the law itself is used as the means of coercion. And this is, this is where uh, all those laws which the British used are even today in practice. And therefore, it makes us very, uh, you say, one got to see what happened before, because when the Constituent Assembly met, the first thing that was brought to the discussion of Constituent Assembly, they said Section 124 and India's independence are incompatible. Now, still we are talking about sedition of Section 124A. Dramatic Performances Act, the way it has been framed in 1876, still continues. All this communal disharmony, bringing surety from the actors, now, for the first time in 1909, actors were sent to jail because they were not able to give sureties. They, they had to undergo one year, a year and a half rigorous punishment. Now, this is where how state and censorship, the severity of which and the, and the perception of the states keep changing comes. It is even in independent India, 
the perception keep changing as the state pursues that yeah thank you thank you yes yeah Yes, uh, you're very right, uh, Dr. Ganachari, and I'm sure Lara will attest to that when she speaks as well. How all the laws, which are you know the laws in the colonial statute, you know, have found themselves you know not to really be discarded, and we still follow these laws. They are you know taken advantage of. They're exploited, and you very rightly pointed out that law gets subverted as well. and in fact uh, maybe later in the discussion i would also like to come to you know the paper that you delivered at the workshop uh, in um, the uk uh, at at a university in the uk i think it was a lockboro university where you delivered that paper as powers of performance and performance of power and it's instructive when you refer to uh, the deliberations that were taking place uh, you know when the dramatic performances bill was introduced so we'll we'll come to that in the discussion uh, i will now request uh, sudanwa deshpande to come on board uh, thanks very much deepa um, you see the question uh, professor ganachari raised which is how is it that sedition continues to be on the statutes of independent india and this is a it's an important question to think about today in one of the things that's happening to people who dissent is that immediately there's this whole you know army of trolls and this and that and all the rest of it who start calling you anti national yes now what does this anti national really mean now i would say that sedition makes sense in in principle as a concept um it makes sense in a case in a situation that is like a colonial situation or you have a king or something like that right if you have an elected uh, elected government the idea of sedition doesn't make any sense because the whole point of elections is that the people should have the opportunity to change the government as and when they feel dissatisfied with the government now if you say that there's something called sedition that is aside and apart from all of this then what does that mean actually it means that every 5 years when we go to vote we are committing an act of sedition because uh, because potentially we have the power to change the government uh, and and it just makes no sense to me uh, now what's happened uh, is that in the last um, uh, in the last 6 years in particular after uh, after the bjp government led by mr modi came in in particular this idea of sedition has been deployed again and again and again now i am not a legal expert i am a theater person i am an actor director and so on i can't speak about the legal aspects of it but what i can say is that all of us are being accused of being anti national right and uh, and so therefore one has to think about what this idea actually means and i'll come back to um, i'll come back to one of the figures that was uh, mentioned by professor garnsia um, playwright called krishna ji prabhakar khadilkar uh, who was an associate of uh, of tilak now when tilak was uh, was tried for sedition and was sent to jail it was actually for articles written by by khadilkar right and i'll come back to this idea at the um, at the end of my presentation for the moment what i want to say is that is that censorship only works at the end of the day censorship only works if it works towards inducing self censorship because if it doesn't strike the fear of uh, or, or, or of the state coming down on you or whatever some other force is coming down on you strongly if it doesn't strike that fear in the hearts of artists who then start censoring themselves censorship by itself is will never be really effective how many people can you put in jail it's impossible how many people how many books can you ban how many films can you ban etc etc now the whole point of censorship is that it should it should make artists and intellectuals and, who, and whoever else feel so scared that they self censor themselves now if if you look at the history of censorship in india then i feel uh, i am not a scholar in this field but uh, as a practitioner 
I feel that you can broadly trace three broad sort of phases, let's say. The first phase is the one that has been already talked about by Professor Ganachari, which is really, and it continues into independent India, which is really the state that comes in and censors with laws and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, it's really in the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s that you find increasingly a trend towards censorship, of what I would call censorship of the street, not so much censorship by the state. And, um, uh, and so what you find is that there are attacks on artists. Um, you spoke about my book on Sabdar Hashmi. Now the attack on Jannatimans that killed Sabdar Hashmi was what? It was, an, uh, it was an attempt to censor because the moment you kill somebody, that's the ultimate censorship, right? There's no further censorship you can do, right? And so uh, these kind of attacks, which were not accompanied by, in most cases, they were not accompanied by legal measures, right? So for instance, the attack on the film, uh, um, um, let's say water uh, or fire and so on, these were not accompanied by legal measures, but these were censorship uh, attempts to impose censorship on the street to just terrorize people into not being able to do their work, right? And today what you find is that there's an there's a unholy sort of coming together of the censorship of the street and the censorship of the state. And why is that? Because the censors of the street are now occupying the highest positions in government today. All of these people who are sitting in powerful positions from the top offices of the, uh, of the Indian state down to the lowest level, at the district level and so on, many of these people are from organizations that believe in censorship, organizations of the Hindu right, the RSS and so on and so forth. Now, they've been trained in that. Their whole life has been spent in training, being trained to, uh, uh, trained to terrorize. That's literally what it is. And I feel like um, we are now today at a point where uh, this is now becoming absurd. It's beyond absurd. Just last week, one found that Professor Apurvanan, for instance, in Delhi, has been questioned by the Delhi police. Now, uh, just the fact of his being questioned, well, all right, he's a citizen, and, you know, the police has the right to question anybody, but it's coming on the back of a whole series of other things that have been happening. And I don't want to go into the details of all of that, but the point I want to make is, that what are they being accused of, all of these people, including Professor Apurvanan, they're being accused of inciting riots in Delhi. Who incited riots? It was actually the politicians of the Hindu right. It was BJP politicians who incited the riots. Instances of inflammatory speeches, incendiary speeches, are not being investigated at all. Hate speech, the fact that you have a uh, statute on the on the law books about hate speech means nothing because the people who are talking about love, people like Harsh Mandar, Apurvanan, etc., etc., all of these people are being investigated and the people who incite riots are going scot-free, you know. Uh, and so there's this bizarre way in which censorship of the street has married censorship of the virtual world you know, uh, trolls, internet trolls, and so on. And that is now getting full backing of the censorship of the state. And this is a terribly important um, uh, moment in the Indian Republic, that unless we are able to safeguard whatever remains of our democracy and to, uh, and to expand that, uh, the, that realm, uh, you know, further, we are going to be, um, uh, um, in 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 uh, uh, we are going to be at a, at a place where it will be impossible to create any art you know the last point i want to make before i end is to say that this is not just about artists this is about the entire range of people who are who, who are uh, are involved in the business of the creation and uh, and dissemination of art and ideas in other words, this is not just about individual artists or filmmakers or, you know, uh, or theatre people and so on. But like, for instance, if tomorrow there's a play that happens in Meta, right? And that play comes under attack for whatever reason is thought to be, you know, anti-national, whatever the hell that means and so on. 
what is going to be meta stand and i'm i'm raising this question specifically on this platform because there have been instances not with meta fortunately so far and i hope it never happens to meta uh, you know but there have been instances where uh, uh, this one second, it started raining it's, it's creating a racket i'll just shut the window i'm sorry about that um uh that that there have been instances where you know arts festivals uh there's been a, a performance that happens at an arts festival it happened recently in goa um you know uh, a performance of a of a poem uh at the serendipity festival that came under attack it was said that this was anti national anti hindu whatever the hell and so on it's it's a poem by the poet nagarjun it's classic of hindi literature it's called mantra kavita it's been there for decades you know all of us have grown up knowing the poem reciting the poem for decades now this poem comes comes under attack and what does the responsibility it does the responsibility of the serendipity arts festival and i'm taking this name only because i mean i don't have anything about uh, uh, anything against them in particular but this is a question that all arts organizations generally have to be prepared for and i think it's time that everybody who's involved in the creation and production and dissemination of art and ideas including publishers like myself we all have to think together and we all have to stand behind individual artists and back them because individual artists in most cases will not have the bandwidth and the wherewithal to be able to fight for their rights the last point i want to make is to say is to go back to the example that uh, professor ganachari gave of krishna ji prabhakar khadilkar now here's a man who's a playwright he is an associate of tilak he writes these articles and tilak goes to jail for 6 years what happens in response the working class of bombay goes on strike for 6 days they went on strike to defend the right of lokmanya tilak to write seditious articles in his newspaper the majority of the working class at that time was not educated they could not read these articles for which tilak went to jail right so they went they went on strike there were firings on workers workers got killed as a result of this they fought for the rights of articles that the majority of them could not even read and the and this is my final point that today if artists want to safeguard themselves then it's absolutely essential for artists to go out there and make wider alliances otherwise to expect to sit in your ivory tower to expect that you know i am an artist i am being attacked so therefore it's the is the responsibility of everyone else out there <coughs> to defend me but it's not my responsibility to go out and defend the rights of others or to help others with my art when they come under attack when things like you know demonetization when things like the lockdown happens hundreds of thousands of workers uh, facing the most terrible uh, you know situation artists have to be there fortunately in the case of the lockdown that did happen that continues to happen to a great extent artists have put themselves out there in various ways and so on but the larger point i'm making is when when rights are attacked it's not only artists rights that are being attacked and artists have to be mindful of the fact that they are part of society they have to build larger alliances unless we do that unless we stand up for each other we are all going to be silent thank you ah uh, thank you sudan ba i mean i i can't say how glad i am can you hear me am i audible hello yeah. yes okay. yes you are yeah. deepa okay all right so i i'm i'm, I'm very glad sudanwa that you connected the larger socio political landscape today with the artist concerns about censorship because you're absolutely right to say that today the dialogues have been muddied right so while you have anti national you also have liberal secular or you know you know those kind of terms you know being bandied around to just you know discard you know anybody with a different point of view and uh, 
in fact i was also thinking <laughs> that uh, 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 among the many scary things that have been happening the incident you know that happened in bidar in karnataka uh, when uh, school children you know decided to put up a play about the caa and and the way uh, the local police administration you know clamped down upon them and uh, you know teachers were actually put in prison i mean it goes to show that i mean we we come at a juncture where as you rightly said that it is no longer about just protecting your art but it is about protecting you know the constitution it is about protecting you know the values of the constitution and all those are at enormous risk today and unless and until i mean it was i mean worker mobilizations continue to happen um and while the union movements have certainly been diluted the labor movements have been diluted mobilizations are happening and we see everywhere whether it is you know uh, with uh, with the farmers or with the adivasis you know and those movements are also being clamped down and yes can 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 artists be going out and you know expressing their support or can you think of uh, a, a a larger movement in which artists keep playing a prominent role and performing artists have done that performing artists continue to do that and that is why also performing artists whether it has been the ca protests or you know uh, at uh, shaheen bagh you know they 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 have been attacked and uh, i think those 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 attacks uh, are going to you know grow i don't think uh, they are going to stop and so so one thing is of course you know the solutions that you know we are going to be looking at uh, is something that we need to think about more closely i think it is about solidarity building but how do we go about building the solidarity is a question that we need to ask ourselves uh, with that i will uh, welcome anjum katyal to take over okay can i can you hear me Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Firstly, um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's been really interesting for me to listen to uh, both the uh, speakers who've spoken before me, and I've been thinking a lot about what I can contribute to the discussion. Sorry, As, Anjum. Could you speak up, please? We're not yeah. entirely being able to hear you. Is is it better if I hold this? No. Hello. It's a little better, but perhaps if you remove and speak directly into the mic, it'll be great. Okay, just trying to think if I can increase the volume. Just let me see. Is this any better? Sorry, what? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. but is this better volume wise yeah all right so i was just saying uh, that it's been very interesting to listen to the two speakers before me and i've been trying to think of how i can contribute uh, and complement what they've been saying because some very very important points have been already made uh, this business of um, the fact that uh, uh, the censorship has been around and uh, the legal acts that were in place to protect it and to promote it have actually been there from colonial times they have not been removed in fact uh, they are being uh, they are being sort of uh, uh, used and imposed uh, with impunity in several states that the fact that we need uh, to look at solidarity in a way that uh, has become increasingly urgent these are some very important points and i was wanting to add something which i've been thinking about which is that we are now caught up in a situation where we're looking at censorship as as a very immediate thing that's happening to us uh that is uh, mostly to do with dissent against the government and a certain kind of uh silencing and repression that goes along with any attempt at dissent am i still clear yes okay good uh what i've been thinking of is that we should not lose sight of the fact that we live in a country and a society where silencing of different kinds has actually been around for a very long time women's voices dalit voices uh questions of uh, gender identification uh questions of uh, of uh, caste and religion there has always been some form of silencing going on sometimes very very brutal silencing going on and 
whether uh, these, uh, to my mind, these are all a way of censoring different kinds of um, positions, stances, identifications, which then also lead towards very severe self-censorship. And in the interest of a flourishing democracy, where I would say that the more multiplicity uh, is, is allowed to flourish, uh, it's important to recognize that these kinds of censorship and silencing have not only been there in the past, but continue to walk amidst us even now, and uh, have certainly not gone away. So you do have the censorship which is, in, which is uh, imposed through law, you have censorship which is imposed through the power of the state. Very often the state will ally with goons and with non-state actors to uh, further a kind of uh, ideology or belief system or value system which allows them to, uh, to apply what they see as justified quieting, justified silencing, justified shutting up of uh, certain kinds of positions and protests. So along with that, you also have very long and deep-rooted societal pressures, which have very often um, ended up with silencing and censoring uh, different kinds of attempts at expressing independence, freedom, whether it's from a position of a liberated woman, whether it's, as I said, a sexual orientation, whether it's uh, religious freedom, so we have lived with those censorships too. And one of the things I feel is important for us to recognize is that very often nowadays I feel that we get caught up in a kind of a sense of, um, of despair over the fact that we are living in this society at the moment where dissent has become such, it's almost become like a bad word. You daren't criticize, you daren't stand up, you daren't speak up because it would get slammed so hard that you know you really need to run for cover. Almost everything, whether you're, you pointed out quite rightly, Deepa, whether you're school kids, whether you're young idealistic college kids, whether you're questioning ideas that have been taught to you by the best minds in your country, whether you're um, just people who have an idea of democracy which they want to uphold. I mean, wherever you are, whoever you are, if you are daring to speak out against certain kinds of held positions, you are seen as a threat, whether you are a political activist or not, whether you are a so-called terrorist or not, you are seen as a threat. And that's become a very uh, pervasive atmosphere in which many of us now find ourselves living. I wanted to say that in the light of that, what I find very useful is to reiterate that as a country and as a society, we have a very strong and very rich history of not just protest, but also resistance. And even if you look just at theater, we are talking about starting with the colonial times, when it was felt necessary to bring in a law, because theater activists were coming up with plays that were inciting people to rage against an inequal and unfair system, which was the colonial system. Uh, talk, starting right from then, right through the 40s with IPTA coming up and doing plays which made people uh, resist in many ways, fight back in many ways, become aware, right through the 50s and the 60s when there was left activism happening in uh, a lot of theatre. You have Uppal Dutt coming up with his political theater in West Bengal, uh, the kind of repression that they faced when they did their plays uh, is unheard of even now if you hear this kind of stories of them being uh, with boiling oil being poured on them, being beaten up, people being shot, people being jailed. Uh, you know, there has been a very strong, very robust tradition of political protest and also along that along with that um, the, uh, resistance of different kinds. You come to the emergency period. The emergency was uh, alive with activity. Uh, Jenam uh, was also there a little later from about 78 uh, onwards they came into street theater. But in Bengal, in Maharashtra, in the South, there were, I mean, I have facts and figures, but this is not the time for them. But just to give you a very broad picture, right? Uh, 
uh, so the, right up to the emergency as well, which was a very repressive time for artists who dared to question or dared to, uh, to dissent against the uh, powers of the state. There was an ongoing activity. So what I feel is that artists we have, we can plug into a very proud history of people who have been completely allied in their social commitment, their fight against inequality, and their art, which they've used, whether as musicians, whether as performers, theater people, um, to create a, a form of pushback, a form of resistance, a form of protest. So I think that uh, it becomes, for me, plugging into this, realizing that this has happened before, that people have dealt with it, that people have found ways of addressing these issues, that we maybe can look for creative ways of allying with each other and coming up with ideas of ways in which we can again take to guerrilla kinds of activity if we need to, or um, use public spaces in a different way. Uh, I think for, uh, it, it, gives a, it gives one a sense of, um, what shall I say, uh, this, this kind of ability to access this history also gives one a sense of um, purpose, of motivation, of knowing that uh, it is not only now and only here, but it has been before and probably will be again. And people, some of our heroes, have been there uh, fighting the good fight. And no doubt there will be others who will come up to do the same. I don't know if I've run out of time, but for now. No, no, you, you, you're fine. You, you, you can speak for a few minutes if you like, but you're okay. fine. So, um, I mean, I, there was something that I found when I was reading up around this, which I wanted to read to you because I just felt um, it would sort of enhance the mood. This is a poem written by Utpal Dutt when he was in prison. This is, he was in prison in 1965, uh, 66 for his political views as a theater activist. And uh, he wrote uh, a couple of, several poems in English. And if I have your permission, I'd like to just read this out. Please, please, please do. Because yeah. I'm thinking of people who've been plucked up and shoved into jail for similar kinds of um, standing up for what they believe in and using their voice to speak out. And this is such a poignant piece written by him. I just wanted to read it. It's called Tired. Prison, today I surrender to you. You know I have fought you, tooth and nail, no holes barred these five months. I've snapped my fingers in your face and sung lusty melodies to, in the gloom of my cell. I've held loud colloquies with the walls, filling the loneliness with bragging defiance. You know what you've done to me these past lonely months? You've bulldozed my mind and laid waste my dreams till the warscape of my thought looks like Guernica, bombed and blasted by fascists. You've taken my wife and child from me and amputated without chloroform the whereabouts, the wherewithal of love and affection. You've destroyed my habits, taken me from my books, damn it, and my work, feeding me constantly on self defeating perversion like rotten apples tossed out from hotels at dawn. You've poisoned me. You're good at it. But today, I'm tired and beaten. You'll admit it's been an unequal fight. The dice have been loaded from the start. The entire state machine, men, rifles, uniforms, and spies against one man. I give up. If that's the way you wish to win, I throw in my tattered towel and holler enough. But don't get me wrong. You've not made me sorry for myself, for I hate self-pity as a virgin hates a chastity. You won't see me cry or whine or beg for mercy on my knees. I won't unsay a word I've said. Won't lick the spittle I've thrown out. You haven't made me want to live a bit differently if I have to live again. I'm just a bit tired, because pardon me. Just a bit weakened by hunger and loneliness. And, and then he goes on saying that, uh, you know, that I wish to sleep now till my tensed flesh melts. But, what I got from this poem was a sensitivity to the despair that you can feel when you feel you're up against such an unequal enemy. But at the same time, the resilience 
that allows the person to continue and to say that they won't give up, they won't surrender, they won't, they won't stop fighting down. And I just thought that this was written by somebody who knew very well what it was like to be penalized for uh, their, their art and their activism. Uh, and it goes back so many years. It sounds like it could be written by anybody who's been locked up in prison. And we know so many of them. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjum, for this poem. And I was going to say the same thing that you just said, that given with you know, so many uh, people, and some of them you know, whom we know also, you know, lawyers, um, artists, activists, uh, who are languishing in our prisons today. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that poem. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the other term that came to my mind when you immediately talked about guerrilla tactics is that, uh, well, today you can be an urban Naxal, right? And that's, that's again, a convenient label that yeah. uh, uh, the state can get away with. Okay, um, I'm not going to say more because I know that the last speaker is going to be saying a lot about this. And on this note, I shall ask Lara to take over. Thanks, Deepa. And uh, thank you to the earlier panelists. I think they've laid the ground quite well. And uh, especially to Professor Arvind, who's, uh, who, who charted the course of how censorship and self-censorship have played out in the uh, colonial times and how it's still being continued today. I, you know, uh, I find, and, and much of, you know, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, political aspects of uh, censorship and self-censorship that have been covered by the uh, earlier speakers also, you know, uh, uh, brings us to what's happening today. I think uh, uh, while there's a very strong development discourse that, you know, people have bought and that is, you know, being projected by the government, uh, what we're seeing increasingly is that in, uh, you know, in, in the name of uh, this modernization and an expansion of scale uh, in terms of the economic, uh, uh, you know, development, we are also seeing at the same time, uh, you know, shrinking democratic space, which is, which is a very strong facet of how this regime has functioned. So while we've seen most of these oppressive laws, these draconian, you know, laws being used in the past, I think the, the biggest difference between what happened in the past and what happened in the, you know, last six years, which is also something that, um, you know, Sudhanva uh, uh, G spoke about, uh, is that uh, there is a very systematic uh, manner in which these oppressive laws are first being used. Uh, I won't say abused because many of these laws were put in place in order to suppress dissent. So uh, it's not an abuse of the law, but the very purpose of the law uh, that is uh, you know, uh, being used right now. And the second thing is that it has an ideological basis. You see, and we cannot run away from it. The entire, you know, uh, nationalist uh, and, and this entire Hindutva ideology, you know, which is at the root of how this law is being, you know, how these laws are being used. It's very important for us to understand the mechanisms uh, with which, you know, these um, uh, kind of attacks are taking place on artists and on all free thinkers and spokes, uh, spokespersons. So I think this is a very uh, important thing that we must always uh, ensure in our debates. And I think our debate has been very, uh, our discussion has been quite rich with it. I wanted to, in particular, you know, uh, talk about uh, uh, what, what, what kinds of control and what are the tools of control that are being used by the government. And uh, uh, see, by, by censorship, uh, is a mechanism to control using law, using power and authority. Self-censorship uh, is, 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 is a method of control using fear. And so most of you know, the censorship, just also like what um, Sudhanwa already said, uh, is in order to instill you know, fear and to, in, to ensure that uh, there is no free expression uh, in the contemporary artists or in the fraternity to ensure that those voices are suppressed and that any kind of dissent or political opposition is killed. And uh, that is the manner in which, you know, uh, we see that also these laws are used is to, to give a message to society. The most of these cases are exemplary cases, right? 
so it's not just about punishing the offender but it is also about giving a message to society that uh, any kind of political opposition will not be tolerated and this is a kind of reprisals that people who engage in such opposition will face well, as far as censorship is concerned there are you know two two major you know categories of censorship one is what we call as pre censorship and the second is you know what we call as post censorship now as far as pre censorship is concerned you know where you know the, the role of certification comes in and you know the role of the censor uh, board comes in uh, is all about you know the pre release censorship on you know cinematographic material on films on theater and uh, uh, this has actually been uh, upheld uh, constitutionally uh, as 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 you know pre censorship being valid uh, in 1970 in the judgment of k abbas that is how actually you know pre censorship has happened so rampantly now one of the biggest problems has been that you know the fact that it was you know held to be constitutionally valid even though it is a supreme court judgment is how actually censorship came to be effected and how that has been over the years so this has happened by a, a you know by, by a supreme court judgment it is uh, as per law now uh, uh, this is uh, you know the, the biggest uh, you know infringement of article 19 1a the freedom of speech and expression the manner in which it has functioned and there were several cases that went to court including you know the band between case including uh, you know uh, several cases uh, on release including even padmavat case you know which were uh, which, which went in for uh, stay of the movie in 2017 uh, in fact two two judgments were passed one after the other one was dismissing the appeal to ban padmavati and or padmavat and the second uh, which was passed about a week later was uh, in the case uh, of um, the uh, uh, the short film of a tale in two cities uh, a tale of two cities which uh, basically uh, you know uh, uh which basically uh, sorry not tale of two, uh, a sig- an insignificant man which was on uh, uh, you know arvind kejriwal from aam aadmi party a movie had been made on him in 2017 and immediately a week after the padmavat case in fact the supreme court came out and said very strongly that the courts should be slow in passing any kind of restraint or order uh, against you know uh, artistic uh, expression of any kind and allowed for that movie to go uh, you know get released but uh, while the courts have passed judgments you know upholding the freedom of speech and expression mota moti you know uh, j- but at the same time what we have seen is that the courts have always upheld uh, you know curbs on the very same freedoms uh, in the name of reasonable restrictions under article 192 of the indian constitution which basically provides that under you know these you know seven conditions there can be uh, you know a uh, uh, restraint on the freedom of speech and expression and uh, uh, some of these also include decency morality and national interest and several other such uh, you know uh, uh, restrictions and uh, uh, these can be interpreted very freely and what we're seeing today in the last 6 years is how it is being interpreted these laws have already been in place for a very long time but how is it being interpreted today and how are these you know uh, uh, laws being actually used against artists used against any kind of free speech and most importantly the democratic right to you know criticize the government and its policies Uh, which is actually one of the uh, uh, one of the biggest i mean i won't say purposes of art i'm a lawyer i am not here to uh, decide what the purpose of art is but it has been the biggest contribution of art to society at least in my view uh, one of the uh, reasons why the state has been so proactive against artists also shows that it is the most effective method you know of uh, uh, you know discussing public policy of uh, uh, engaging citizens of you know promoting an active citizenry and uh, because of its effectiveness the you know state always feels it is important to curb it and to use draconian measures in order to curb it now coming to you know uh, the more draconian measures so we have on the one hand uh, provisions of the ipc that have been used the indian penal code 1860 which is again a colonial law and continue still date with uh, you know changes right now we have a criminal reforms uh, committee that has been put in place in order to uh, look into uh, you know uh, large scale criminal reforms in the three main uh, criminal acts which is the criminal procedure code the indian penal code and the evidence act uh, which has also received a lot of criticism from civil rights and civil liberties groups like ours 
uh, who are saying that this kind of a very important exercise cannot be held during the times of COVID. But uh, we have these uh, laws, which have, you know, uh, the, uh, especially the Indian Penal Code, which has been there since 1860. Many of its provisions have, in fact, been specifically used against artists. And I'm sure, you know, as artists, many are aware of it because uh, I think that's uh, something uh, that that uh, also decides on what kind of art is coming out today. The more and more that uh, that these draconian provisions are used, uh, it shapes the kind of product. It shapes the kind of art that comes out in society because uh, it, it it deters artists from you know uh, uh, you know due to the fear of reprisals. And uh, I think that's been a very big uh, loss for uh, you know uh, the uh, the arts movement in the country. Uh, that we are losing valuable expression. And it could be all forms of creative expression that we are losing because there is a general sense of fear, which is resulting in self-censorship. Now, some of these provisions of the Indian Penal Code uh, that we all know is, you know, one is uh, Section 153A, which is promoting, um, you know, a hate and enmity, insulting religious feelings. Now, this uh, promoting hate and uh, in, uh, uh, enmity, which is, you know, a, a considered to be another anti-national provision in the Indian Penal Code uh, is uh, uh, actually has been used very often in the last couple of years. Even during the CAA protest that uh, Deepa was talking about, uh, we had a case where an artist, in fact, from Bombay, who was holding a poster at, uh, you know, one of the CAA protests, uh, had an FIR filed against uh, under Section 153A by a BJP minister just a couple of months back. And uh, it was only following a sustained campaign and because, you know, the artist came out and clarified a social media campaign that was run after that, that uh, the Maharashtra government, the current government, the Maharashtra Vikas Aghadi government came out and said that, you know, they will review the case and issued orders for, uh, you know, the, the case to be reviewed and the police to close the case. Uh, but this, this provision has been rampantly used uh, in such cases. We've also seen it being used very recently against journalists. You know, journalists like uh, several other, uh, you know, uh, uh, portals and from alternative media that has come up in the last six years uh, in order to, you know, uh, uh, in, in order to be a valuable substitute to the corporate media. Uh, we have seen that uh, many of these provisions have been used again them. We also have Section 295A, uh, which is uh, to hurt, uh, you know, which is also the provision for hate speech. And this is exactly the provision that should have been used against the ministers who incited hatred uh, uh, during the Delhi riots uh, that uh, Sudanba also very uh, openly spoke about. Uh, and uh, instead, we had, we, we've seen that there's been a spurt of cases against students, against teachers, against activists in Delhi, the Delhi riots, and a complete you know, whitewashing of the, uh, and a complete misrepresentation of the case that is taking place uh, in media and supported by media. Uh, we also have provisions like um, 153B, uh, 294 of obscenity. Several of these have been used against the artists time and again. We also have the case where, uh, you know, uh, artists have, uh, you know, uh, especially in post-censorship related cases where there have been bans on books, bans on paintings. We also have the famous uh, MF Hussain case, uh, which was under Section uh, 292. And uh, uh, several of these cases actually dealt with what what would you know best suit Indian sentiments in terms of traditionality, depiction of gods, uh, use of the national emblem, and so and such. Now, uh, coming to the more draconian measures uh, under the laws of sedition and UAPA, uh, I would sorry. Uh, no, Lara, I, I'm sorry. I have to interrupt you, but we are actually running out of time. So is it okay for you to wind up so that we'll quickly move on to the Q&A? Okay, sure, sure. Thanks, yeah. Right. Now, uh, I, I, I specifically wanted to talk about, uh, you know, sedition and UAPA. I hope I get to speak about it a lot more uh, in the discussion session. Uh, but... Uh, uh, but what we have seen of late, and I, I'm glad that the other uh, you know, speakers have already touched upon it, is the use of sedition law, you know, very rampantly, uh, and the kind of uh, you know, uh, cases that have been filed, especially against cartoonists, theater personalities, uh, against you know, organizations uh, like Kabir Kalaman, who have been street theater groups who worked in the rural areas uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, 
raise issues of Dalit atrocities, caste struggles, and also on caste annihilation, I think, which was one of the biggest reasons why they actually uh, caught the ire of the right wing groups and the non state actors, uh, also the state. So I think uh, UAPA and sedition have been in particular used against the most vulnerable of the artists, the Dalit artists, right? The uh, artists without any support, minorities. And I think it's very important to address this question when we talk about how that, uh, what is the nature of the attacks and what are the tools of the attack uh, against artists. I think the, uh, when we see cases such as Kabir Kala Manch where UAPA has been used, one of the most important things that also comes out is the fact that they, they have, uh, while they have a lot of public support in the spaces that they inhabit and the uh, villages that they have gone and they have managed to change public opinion, at the same time, they did not have as much of mainstream artist support. And that also led to a long period of incarcer incarceration for many of these artists. You know, we've seen artists who, in this particular case, artists like Sachin Mali and all who are members of the group were actually released uh, following bail orders from the Supreme Court four years later. So they, were, they spent time in prison for four years. And many of them have been linked you know, uh, uh, to Nagzalite parties, to Maoist groups, termed as urban Nagzals. I think that the kind of measures that are being used against the most vulnerable of the artists uh, and the kind of criminalization that has taken place of the most vulnerable artists is very important to be brought into discourse when we talk about artistic freedoms because unless we talk about you know the, the these very difficult cases we will not be able to get to the root of the problem and we will not be able to also address it so uh, this lacking in our discourse i think i uh, I, I think is one that i feel must you know get filled and uh, i hope to continue with a lot more during the discussion yes uh, I, i'm so sorry lara i've had to cut you short and uh, i know you also wanted to highlight some other cases as well but uh, very quickly i mean because we've nearly run out of time so i'm just going to uh, you know start with the question and answer round because we do have questions from the viewers and i'd like some of their questions to be addressed in fact i'm going to start with you lara there's a question uh, from ramu ramanathan and he says that a public gathering to discuss state censorship would not have been possible in mumbai in the pre covid situation uh, one would require 100 permissions and clearances from you know the various avatars of authority so the question is, will we see censorship on social media platforms soon? And should we be more vigilant about it? I think we're already seeing the censorship on the social media platforms. You know, as far as uh, many of us who are vocal on, uh, you know, platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and uh, uh, several of these public platforms, uh, there have been several attempts to either close down our account or, you know, make our posts invisible or to uh, cut down the uh, you know, uh, viewership of our posts. So that kind of censorship is already going on. And I think that was also one of the important aspects of what I was going to discuss. It's also about how to do art and how to protest in an era of state surveillance. You know, I think that, that's a, a, we haven't been able to adequately address that. You know, what are the various measures that we need to come, uh, you know, that, that, that we need to adopt? Uh, how do we fight this? Because we can't talk about what the problem is. You know, there are so many problems. I think we can just have meetings after meetings on what the problems are. But how do we look at, uh, you know, solving these problems? What are our ways out of them? What are the best practices? I think that is a very important part of the conversation. Yeah. I agree with what, uh, you know, Ramu is saying. Uh, it, 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 even in the pre-COVID times, to come out in protest was extremely difficult. Even during the CAA time, initially, while we did have a lot of successful protests, we managed to, have, you know, uh, uh, be part of, uh, you know, very spontaneous uh, protests that were taking place in Bombay. Bombay was completely charged after a very long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in, in about a month, uh, we started seeing, you know, the kind of curbs coming in, the police permissions being denied, you know, uh, people being picked up from the protest sites, multiple FIRs have been filed, we'll all have to deal with them at some point. So um, this, uh, this, this kind of an atmosphere makes protests on the street extremely difficult, but at the same time, COVID has made it impossible. Uh, and uh, social media is the only recourse. So uh, there is censorship, it's going to increase. Uh, many of us have been tagged, profiled, we are stalked, there are trolls always, you know, um, 
uh, following what we are doing. Right. Uh, you know, they always have some way or the other to cover. Yeah. In fact, with reference to social media, you know, these stand-up comedians who've been trolled recently, right. and actually they've had to go on record. And these were for you know the shows that they created a few years ago, and <laughs> you know, they've had to apologize, you know, for the content that they have created. I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Ganachari from Asha Kutari Chaudhary, and uh, she asks that the Dramatic Performances Act of 1876 is still in place and has not been repealed, and it's sometimes used in some states, which is true. Uh, why has there been no lobbying to get rid of this and in the same way that you know Section 377 got you know eventually repealed? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as a historian, I can say that, that this law has been very much abused by the state. And it still continues harass. The social groups will have to come together and fight against many laws which are totally redundant. Right. The very law, I mean, this law, of, is a Dramatic Performances Act, came as a cognate law to the Act of Sedition, which was inserted in 1870, Act 5. Huh? Now, uh, sedition was the most important. This was part of it uh, as, as a continuation of that. But today, when that's why I began first saying that we need to educate ourselves. And we need to you say, first thing that took place in, that's why I repeated in Constituent Assembly what uh, Gandhi called uh, Section 124 as the Prince of Oppression, uh, that, that particular clause, and which the constitution framer, before talking about any other thing, they said that this section 124A and India's independence are incompatible. Right. Now, it must be chiseled in mind today that this was the one clause which was most abused against Indians. And now we are using the same method to abuse ourselves. I mean, our own dissent is a part of a democratic society. Right. And why all these laws came, why theatrical movement came, because all other forms of legitimate forms of grievance, ventilating grievances were closed. So they had to take up to this kind of uh, agitation through mass mobilization, through uh, my, say, theatrical movement. Right. Now, in doing this, they did one most important thing that is concurrent to the evolution of Indian state they projected the formulation of state, nation on the theater, and they made theater itself a nation. Now, here, here now the post in, uh, say independence is a different situation. Yeah. We will have to seriously think of these laws, colonial, draconian laws, yeah. and make a movement to uh, bring it to the relevant, say, concerned people to. Absolutely. Right. No, in, in, in fact, I'd like to, you know, tell Asha, you know, uh, to the question that she has posed that as Lara said, you know, uh, you will have various judgments where the judiciary has gone on record, you know, to protect freedom of speech and has said, you know, that the state cannot impose its will, uh, you know, where freedom of speech is concerned and the state should be very careful, you know, before imposing such restrictions. And, uh, in fact, uh, in a 2013 judgment uh, uh, that uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, where a journalist, you know, for his theater group, you know, protested that, you know, he has to, you know, show the script of the play to the commissioner of police and the court, you know, read down that provision saying that, you know, that should not be permitted. So you, we, we do have some hope from the judiciary, but unfortunately, what happens is that is is that the first the first reaction is to charge sheet you, and then the process itself becomes you know so trying that uh, it uh, you know uh, you, you 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 lose hope and you you do feel defeated, and therefore there are absolute limitations with law, and all the more reason why advocacy needs to be built. Okay, so I'm now going to go to another question asked by uh, Shreya Adhikari to Sudanwa Deshpande. How important do you think it is for artists to showcase dissent through their art at all times or to make a point at all times? Does silence always mean siding with the other side? Well, <clears throat> um, 
on the whole i would say that dissent and uh, and protest and so on can also take many 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 forms you know um sometimes silence uh, can also be dissent can also be um, a very yeah. potent uh, way of protesting uh, um, and so on but to keep quiet is different when things are terrible around you and you keep quiet and you say no it's not my job to speak up it's somebody else's job to speak up it's always somebody else's job to protect my rights right uh, that is what um, um, is a problem uh, of course one uh, one doesn't mean that uh, you know all art should only be sort of you know uh, uh, marching with placards in uh, in your hands and uh, and flags and so on but uh you can have art that is funny that is satirical that is tongue in cheek that can bring down the oppressors through humor um and so on you can you can poke all kinds of holes in the in the in the big balloon of sort of invincibility that they that they try and build um and, and so on so so there can be very many different ways in which uh, you can speak up but speak up you must even if it is speaking through silence sometimes but speak up you must because if we don't speak up uh, then tomorrow there's going to be complete silence yes in fact to that i'd uh, like to you know um, uh, highlight the comment made by joyce sen gupta he says that when utpal dat was arrested in the 60s lakhs came out in the streets to protest uh with icons like satyajit ray also present forcing the government to release utpal dat who then performed the contentious play kalol at the brigade maidan for thousands in attendance and no one was labeled anti national then of course today it is a very different uh, situation and such democratic audacity he says is very very difficult okay so there's a question for you anjum uh, from sammohan mathodia and shreya adhikari again we saw artists coming together beautifully during the whole caa nrc protest at the shaheen bagh protest with lots of artists musicians theater artists poets using their art to showcase dissent however the gap still lies in a collective literature of these beyond the physical protest so social media is one medium what are your thoughts about an organized collection of art in any form being important for protest and shouldn't that revolutionary art form be published <laughs> that's going to be very difficult by the government or any bodies in power um, to empower art mm. uh, well i think it's a, i think it's a wonderful glorious idea i mm. don't know how it will work out in practice but uh, i do feel it's important which is what i was trying to say in my presentation that we remain connected with uh, the knowledge that uh, we have a history and an access to uh, a tradition of protest art which has come out spontaneously which people have made because this feeling that you're struggling against something that nobody else is you know that you're you're fighting alone is is a very very dispiriting one and just for joy the example joy gave of how people came out in support us so i think people come out in support uh, and know that artists are working together on something so platforms networks what uh, sudanwa said earlier about solidarity across causes you know even whether it's people who are fighting for different kinds of rights but they're all fighting for the democratic right to uh, to to speak up and to protect you know society and try and fight for justice i think those things are very important and wherever they can be forums that can publish these things i think they should we may be talking more about multiple things rather than multiple forums rather than single publication that can come up there may be access to networks of people who are producing or or allowing this stuff to be published Uh, but ramu has a trickier question for you so ramu ramathan asks you that why are so many people pro censorship whenever a government agency or a group suppresses dissenting voices they nod what do you have they nod yes nod. Uh, i wish i didn't know those people ramu <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't know i mean 
to me, dissent is in, it's just an inherent part of being an ordinary human being. I mean, you have dissent within a family, you have dissent within relationships, you have dissent in democracy. I mean, the right to dissent is basic, I would say. So I don't know why people nod when they're censorship. I wish. Uh, we find a lot of people nodding these days, actually. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, and I think that's where the problem is that, you know, state censorship has always existed, what you might call the anxiety of the state, you know, to control. So if you look at the scheme of the Dramatic Performances Act, it is regulatory, it is restrictive, yeah. it is prohibitive, it is penalizing. Uh, but the, when moral censorship kind of joins yes. that, and it, as Sudanda said, when it comes to the street, you know, and when you're actually threatened with violence, you know, what, what, what do you do at that point in time? Okay, so there's another question for you, Lara, by Arundhati. What because does an artist with less than ideal privileges who has been charged with sedition have in an Indian court since very few high profile lawyers take them pro bono? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, Deepa very, uh, you know, aptly said it, uh, that in case of sedition and UAPA, uh, the process itself is the punishment. And uh, uh, most of the artists, you know, who come from vulnerable sections who, uh, and the other ones who are actually the ones penalized under UAP and sedition, it is not the high profile artists who actually face, uh, you know, such kind of uh, draconian uh, measures. Uh, uh, they do not have the means to, uh, you know, uh, combat the kind of the, the, the criminal justice system, especially when you have, uh, you know, advocate generals appearing for the state and, um, you know, there's this whole huge... Uh, uh, a public media campaign, uh, you know, uh, calling them anti-national, vilifying them, you know, calling them anti-state. Uh, they're actually against a very, very big opponent, and uh, they, they require uh, the uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, legal um, aid, the, the support from civil society in order to fight these cases that many times they cannot generate. I think it is only. I think it is only. Uh, sorry. I think it's only artists, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, as I think it is only, uh, you know, the, the civil society groups, civil liberties groups, the lawyers who have come forward, done advocacy in cases like this. Like if we see the Kabir Kala Manch case, we had senior advocate Mihir Desai, who's also a part of PUCL. I'm also a part of PUCL. Uh, he's the convener of the PUCL Maharashtra, who represented, uh, you know, the accused in that case. Uh, and who are artists from, uh, you know, like Sachin Mali's Cheetal Sate. Cheetal Sate, in fact, was pregnant and she was given bail only on humanitarian grounds in, in a very advanced stage of pregnancy uh, by the Bombay High Court. So these uh, uh, cases were, uh, you know, uh, extremely uh, difficult on the uh, artists and uh, there was not enough, I think, even support from the artist community, uh, if I may say so. Uh, you know, in, in some of these cases, because many of many fellow artists don't want to come out and openly declare their support because they don't want to be clubbed in the same gang of anti-nationals. And they do not want to lose the state support. They have their films getting released. They don't want issues with the sense support and etc. So it is a, it's, it's a very difficult choice to make. But the lack of artist solidarity also has been, you know, exploited by the state very well. We have pro bono lawyers who come forward and, uh, you know, um, fight these cases. But most of the times, bail is extremely difficult in these cases. Yes. So, you know, in, in cases like sedition, in UAPA also, uh, it's extremely difficult to get bail. Uh, uh, UAPA even more than sedition because uh, the statute itself, uh, you know, uh, uh, provides for... Um, you know, no bail until a charge sheet is filed and an extended period uh, until when a charge sheet can be filed, you know, to one year. Right. So you're talking about uh, a person being punished even before the trial commences. Yes. Right. And uh, the label, the label is so difficult to hold out in society to come out and to be able to, you know, get projects again, you know, to be able to, even, even if you do come out after three and four years, nobody wants to touch you. So we're talking about, you know, a... Uh, 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 Punishment at many different levels. There is societal punishment. There is, of course, the, the legal process, which is itself a punishment. There is a moral judgment, you know, the stigma attached to it. You know, you're automatically, uh, you know, labeled as a Nuxalite, a Nugan Nuxal, the, the big, you know, the great, uh, uh, you know, two words that were coined. Um, and you also, of course, are anti-national against state interests. And so, you know, uh, looked at as, uh, you know, a traitor. You know, that's what a you know, person accused with sedition is called. It's the, the offense is called Dej Duro 
in Hindi. All right. I'm so sorry, but uh, we've run out of time. I mean, I'd love to continue this. There's so much to speak about, you know, the subject, but I'm being pestered by the organizers and, and they're saying that let's wrap up. So if I just wanted yeah. to say one thing. I'm sorry. Yes. One yeah. thing. I wanted to say, of course, there's a lot of advocacy going on around this. I think that was what was what what I missed in talking in my initial uh, part. I was I was just getting to that. There is, you know, th there are groups which have come together for repeal of sedition. Uh, there, in fact, we did so much advocacy last year. In fact, before the 2000 <coughs> elections, if you see the Congress Party's manifestos, they said they would repeal sedition. In fact, there was a case filed against Rahul Gandhi for including that in the manifesto. So there has been a very vibrant campaign against sedition. I think it's important for artists, especially, to join it. Yeah. You know, so it's an appeal that I want to make. That's why I'm taking the extra minute. The second thing, also, there is an active campaign against UAPA, and of course which requires a lot of support from all communities because Absolutely. there is so much stigma attached to UAP. Absolutely. And we have been doing very successful advocacy for all of this. But very importantly, I think it's very important to actually support our students. I think that is where the, they are the most under attack today. What happened in FTII, we were all part of those protests, we were part of the advocacy, where students were left completely you know, disenchanted and disillusioned. And they were left to fight you know, criminal cases under 332, 3, uh, you know, 323 uh, IPC, several provisions of the IPC. They're still fighting them today. Yeah. And, let, and let's let's also not forget that these laws are abused, you know, because clearly there is within the laws to suggest that unless, you know, an event leads to, you know, violence, to sabotage, you do not penalize that person, you do not charge cheat that person, but there's a complete abuse of law. Uh, the other thing I think very quickly I'd just like to add is that we also have to remember in these times that, that clearly binaries are being drawn, sides are being taken. So there are artists who are also clearly supporting the state. But I mean, a whole round of other discussions can be held on this. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Sanjoy uh, for the closing remarks. I want to thank the Meta team again. And thank you, Meta, for being patient to allow us to continue a little longer. Thank you all very, very much, panelists, for being here, for saying yes to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank you so much, Deepa. And thank you, Lara. Professor Ganachari, Sudhavna, and Anjum Katyal. I just wanted to do a quick comment. I know we're running out of time. It's really the next session that's going to start, Deepa, and that's the reason yes. why Suraj was trying to persuade us yes. to wrap up. I wanted to, one, Lara, just thank you and all the legal aid that uh, is being provided pro bono uh, across the country uh, for students and, and artists and artisans fighting the many cases against them and to reply to Sudhavna's thing about, uh, you know, will Meta stand up? Uh, you know, Sudhavna, at Teamwork, this is not the first time that we've been attacked either by the left or the right. This is something that we have experienced over 13 years, ever since we have uh, uh, brought festivals back to India. Uh, it won't be the first time, certainly won't be the last time. We can do what we have to do, which is stand for what we think is the right of every individual and every uh, community or group of people to say their bit. Because our thing is that these are platforms and platforms must be supported in every way. And it's only when you support a platform and it's only when you come to a, con to a platform in a considered way, will you allow the public, as we were talking about, uh, those on the street who without knowledge, without information, uh, through a process of ignorance and misinformation are, um, are asked to act for or on the behalf of A group of people or B group of people. We are very clear that our role across our festivals and across platforms of communication like this is to make sure that everybody is able to present their point of view in a considered way within the democratic traditions of uh, debate, discussion uh, that formulate free speech, being respectful of the fact that there are lines that we must be conscious of more so today than any other time. Going back to Professor Ganachari's comment of, Shiv of, of Shivaji's poem uh, um, or, or soliloquy uh, that was aimed at Aurangzeb today, it could well be in many ways, um, you know, communicated in a different sort of way. 
um, and we will absolutely fight the good fight. Um, and thanks to the lawyer community, who's really been very supported, supportive of us. And as you know, we've also had sedition, blah blah blah. All of these cases have also been aimed at me and us at various points of time. We will continue the the good fight. But as you all have collectively said, and Lara, Anjum, Sudhavna, Professor Ganachari, Deepa, all of you said. The voice can't be alone. The voice has to be a collective voice. The voice has to be one of reason. The voice has to be the responsibility of not one or two people. It's each of us in a considered place of power, because we know that power, irrespective of the color of it, whether it's left or right or center or today or yesterday or day after, the minute power comes into the equation. It's that person, those group of people, who continue to act despite all the promises that they may have made or wish to have made. The first blacklist of the NGO community was made by the previous dispensation, which is supposed to be liberal. Let's not forget that either. Uh, emergency and all of these other things that we've seen, whether it's in Bengal or Kerala or continuing in the Northeast and Kashmir, etc., are issues absolutely to be addressed. What you all have said today has been more than just valuable. Thank you all for being so forthright, uh, for putting it into perspective. It's a long fight out there. It's not an easy fight. But collectively, academia, uh, people in the arts, as Lara said, these are the people who made a difference. This is the contribution that they've made to society by holding up a mirror. And unfortunately, more often than that, not society wishes to crack the mirror, not just governments. Governments are only reflective of the society that they represent. And today we are seeing the dominance of the conversation on the street, the sentiment of the street, which is not necessarily a sentiment, which is considered just a sentiment of misinformation and ignorance. We must we must correct that. We must help students. Thank you all so much. Over to you, Suraj. Thank you, Deepa, for yeah. that brilliant, absolutely brilliant panel and for taking this on on all our behalf. Much, much appreciation. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you, Anjum, Lara, Dr. Ganachari, and Sudhanba for such an incredible session. Fabulous presentations, very informative, and really enjoyed it. Sorry for wrapping it up as we have to start our next session in 10 minutes. So really sorry, really sorry for that. Thank you, Deepa, for being a fabulous moderator and curator of this session. Thank you very, very much. I, I thank the panel again. I couldn't have put it off without them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Once again, we would like to thank Mahindra Group for the support to the arts. Uh, we would also like to thank the Mani and Windy Banga Family Trust for supporting the theater conference. And thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed this conversation. And we'll log back on for our next session at 4 p.m. The Need for Critics with Gayatri Sinha, Ananda Lal, Mayank Shankar, Deepa Gehlot, moderated by Mukund Padmanabhan. Stay tuned for more information. Thank you once again and see you shortly.